Hey, I'm Isabel Burka, and when I was 12 years old, I founded a multi-million dollar bath and body products company called De Bomb Bath. After five years of building my own brand, I've discovered a passion for helping young and innovative entrepreneurs tell their stories. Hopefully, you'll be inspired by the guests here on build a biz and maybe even motivated to start a business of your own. Let's get into it. This is build a biz with Isabel Burkhoff. Hey everybody, it's Isabel Burka here. Thank you so much for joining me on build a biz Today I have two very special guests with me. They are Max Hirsch, a serial entrepreneur, and Sana Vlut, a model, chef, and content creator. And they are both the co-founders of Nikohama Matcha. Thank you so much to you both for joining me here today. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. <laughs> so whose idea was it to start the matcha business? Sanas. <laughs> I was thinking, was it? Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, we, like years ago, all um, both wanted to, you know, start something together. And like, we were first thinking about like the tea space and we love matcha so much. So the idea of matcha was there for so long. Um, and then I think over quarantine, I was like, let's just do it. Let's just start it. Yeah, Sana at the start of quarantine was like, oh, we need to do something or I need to do something. Um, talking about herself and uh, what happened was she made a joke and I was like no you can't do that as a joke and she took it kind of like as a challenge and uh, within a few weeks had already gotten in touch with a bunch of farms and had uh, started discussions uh, and also my mom had started helping out a little bit as well with translation and that was kind of the start of it and then things started coming in but it took a long time for any of the samples to come in well, you know at that point we had already tested a lot of matcha ourselves just from our personal use yeah. and uh yeah, you you started it. it was your idea that's super inspiring that you just took the initiative to start a business over quarantine um so max you mentioned that your uh, mom was helping you translate and i know that your family is from japan so i'm just gonna go out on a limb and say that you were sourcing your matcha from japan yeah, yeah, we have to. Uh, you know, that's part of why we wanted to start something was because whatever a lot of the matcha products that we had tasted or tested here in the United States didn't taste anything like the high-end matcha that we would have in Japan. So we wanted to bring something here that people could enjoy because a lot of the matcha here is just bitter. It doesn't taste very good. And it's because it's not, um, it's not fresh and it's not that high quality. Um, so we decided to bring something that, you know, we felt like the Japanese would also enjoy, but bring it here to the States. Yeah. And you had tasted matcha before Sana introduced it to you, right? Oh, no, of course. Yeah. No, I had it growing up. My mother made us matcha from time to time. And whenever we went to Japan, we'd have some, but, um, again, it was very different than what I first experienced when Sana brought matcha home. Yeah. I, um, I think I just got it in like cafe in New York for the first time. And like, I started to making it myself, but at that time with a lot of milk, I didn't really know exactly what it was, but I really immediately like really loved the taste. Um, and Max is actually the one who was like, Sana, this is not really how matcha is supposed to taste like, like you're drinking garbage, like with milk, it tastes so much better. But so that's kind of where we like started to dive deep. And when I first started reaching out to these farms in, 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 uh, in Japan, the Japanese work in very specific ways. And like, you know, uh, I really needed Max mom to like help communicate there because we wanted to get like the best quality obviously and also from places where you know what wasn't like americanized and uh where there was a translator already in place so we wanted the real deal yeah we wanted something authentic and we wanted to get something a little unique you know we didn't want to bring to market something that somebody else was already selling here or something that somebody had already found so you know we basically looked in places that were very uh i guess not the, the hot spots for matcha you know my, my family told us Hey, just so you guys know, not all good matcha comes from Uji. And obviously Uji is the birthplace of Japanese matcha. It's where the monks first brought it. They started growing it there, but that doesn't mean it's the best. So we decided to look around and, you know, we tasted how many? Oh my God, over 300 matchas. Like, yeah. <laughs> we, it was a lot, a lot of matchas, yeah. Oh my gosh, 300 matchas? Are you sick of matcha yet or no? <laughs> No. Sick of bad matcha. 
Yeah, it was, I mean, that much was bad. So, like, sometimes we had, like, 10 in a row, and we would drink it, like, um, they call it, like, thick tea. So it's kind of, like, very thick, like, barely any water. So we could really um, taste it. And, yeah, many of them were really bad. So, like, after 10 times, every 10, we kind of had to take a little break and reset before we started it because most of the matchas are so bitter. And we had tried one in the past, experienced one in Japan, too, which wasn't bitter at all. So we knew there was matcha out there which didn't have this bitter aftertaste and would fit or tasting palate better. Yeah, that would fit the kind of the profile that we thought would be best for, for people here in the States and then abroad in Europe. Uh, we wanted to make sure that um, it was also very green. You know, a lot of matcha today, you know, you get it in a package and you don't know how old it is. It could be a year old and it still has another year uh, of shelf life. So you look at it and it's like a little bit yellow. It's because it's oxidized. It's, you know, it's, it's a, in a way, it's a green leaf that's been ground into a powder. So the sooner you consume it, the better, because that's when it kind of, it's when it's fresh. And a lot of the matcha powder here in the States is, you know, quite uh, dated. Mm -hmm. And that just kind of goes to show that, like, even though you could have just gone with one of the first matches that you're like, oh, this is okay. You knew what you had in mind for your business. And you're like, if we're going to put a product out there, I, I really want it to be the best. And you just, you persisted. That's actually one of the things um, I hold like some, some key words to when I'm um, kind of conducting business myself and persistence is one of them because, you know, a great business doesn't happen without persistence. So that's really awesome. Yeah. Something else I'd like to ask both of you. So you, you both, you're a couple, you're dating, and um, you work together. What's that dynamic like? <laughs> well, we, before we started, uh, started Nekohama, we also worked together in a way. Uh, Mek was helping me with things, you know, around like content and like also with, with YouTube and like management and stuff. Um, the funny thing is that there in that field, we were kind of not a good working duo or a private life. I wish, I wish I could tell like, uh, what, yeah, like I wish, um, it would all work out, but like in that way, we were, our relationship would suffer from a work relationship. So we decided not to do that. But the interesting part is on Nekohama, we are great in working together. Because it's not my business, it is our business. And it feels like we're really doing this like together. And mm -hmm. um, I feel like Max is really leading kind of the whole business side of Nekohama. And I am leading the yeah create, creative. creative on it. And it's been like a good combination. And we've been working really well together there. Yeah, a good way to think about it is there was... A, there was a, an imbalance when I was working for Sana, kind of helping her as a manager, because I, first of all, I didn't want to manage my girlfriend. And even though it was working, everything was going well, it was just more so that working for someone versus working with someone, it's a different dynamic. And when you're managing someone, you're pretty much working for them or working, you know, on their behalf. Now, when we're working for uh, working on Nekohama together, it's like a collective project. We're putting, putting both of our energy into something that isn't owned by one of us or that isn't our career, my career, Sana's. It's a lot more fun. And we find that we can, you know, kind of spare our wings there. And it doesn't, uh, it's not a place where we butt heads. But yeah, in, in our relationship, it definitely suffered because, you know, we were always working together, talking, you know, nine to five we're working together. And then after that, we're living together. And it just kind of, through quarantine, it got a little tough. But now yeah. it's amazing. Yeah. I remember when I first started my business, um, and then it was sort of at the point where my parents jumped in, um, and it, it was kind of tough at first because you, when you go to work and you have a normal job, you can sort of separate your life and work, and then um, you sort of have time to cool down. But even today, like I'll find myself working at like. 10 p.m. with my family and we'll be like, okay, we just really need to take a break right now. But I will say it's interesting that you two have that creative, almost administrative dynamic because my sister and I, we also have that dynamic. So I would say I'm a little bit more focused on like the creative side of things. And then she's a little bit more into like, okay, what are the actual steps we're going to take to make these creative processes happen? So that's really cool. Um, yeah, and obviously your other co-founders, uh, Jason and Jesse, are our best friends. 
And, you know, at the beginning, it was kind of also to see like, okay, how is that going to work out? You know, because we're and working with your boyfriend, girlfriend and best friends. And actually, it's been the best decision ever because yeah. it's just been it when we're all working all day, sometimes too late in the evening, it really doesn't feel like work. It just like feels like we're a group of friends building something amazing together. That's true. Yeah. yeah. And I think working with friends, you have to pick which friends, you know, they say don't work with friends and don't work with family. But if you have the right friends and you've cultivated the right relationships and uh, you trust them, then it's a beautiful thing because there's nothing better than winning with your friends or succeeding with people you love. And I think that that's the difference between working with, you know, in a company where you don't know everyone very well or intimately or working with a small group of people that, you know, you care about everything that they do because you're just that involved. So it's a beautiful thing to do this with our friends and, you know, a few of uh, a few people that we used to work with in the past. So it's been a wonderful experience. Yeah. Yeah. That's super cool too, because I know like when I'm working with my family, it's never a thing where, you know, you both kind of touched on this. It's never like my business, it's our business. So that really makes it easier to consider other people's feelings and then not really ever feel like, oh, like this person's going to get the promotion or something like that, because you know that you're all on the same side and you're all on the same team and you want the same thing. So that's really cool. I'd love to also just quickly touch on, it's cool that you guys are so honest about, um, you know, hardships with like friendships and relationships and stuff that you just were able to say, yeah, like it was tough. And we totally admit it. Cause I feel like sometimes on social media, everybody tries to like sugarcoat stuff and kind of like, I mean, I think it's improving now. Um, but like people on social media can be kind of brutal as you probably both know, you know, Sana, I think you have 685 K followers on Instagram now. And how many subscribers on YouTube? Uh, over a million. Yeah. So the, that's yeah. growing every day too. Like I know that those numbers changed since um, when we were first talking about this interview. So that's really crazy. And it's just cool to see you both be like so honest about the process. And that's really cool. Yeah, when it comes to social media, I think Sana's great with it because she posts and doesn't spend much time there. And when, you know, the thing is there's a lot of angry people out there who have a lot of negative things to say because they're really sad. So when someone comes onto your page and, you know, throws out something negative, at the end of the day, you know, the, you just got to have compassion for those people because that that's how bad their day is going, that they have taken time yeah. out of their day to go and just throw out some negative energy. I mean, it's a way for them to release whatever they have inside. But, um, if, you know, I, I think you've done a really good job just not letting it get to you. Yeah, I think that um, I do not take those comments very serious. And also, honestly, shout out to my whole community who is extremely, extremely positive um like the amount of like bad comments and stuff it's very minimal which is amazing and i think also that that's been kind of my goal with the whole like youtube and video is kind of showing sometimes like the behind the scenes and kind of the more difficult side to things so even like you know when i was modeling i was one of the first models who were also you know, taking camera backstage onto shows, but also in my hotel room or when I was alone, like moments which were, you know, not as fun and not as glamorous. And I really wanted to show that because um, I saw how a lot of young girls were always like looking up to that image, like, oh my God, being a model and doing this. And now kind of also starting a business to kind of show people like the work, what goes in there, like the difficulties you're facing and kind of... Um, I want to guide people through like a learning process as my own experience as an example. Mm -hmm. And even I, I have like, you know, a drop in the ocean in terms of influence and, you know, my platform is so small compared to yours, Sana, but um, even I will experience like negative hate from some people. If like a um, popular YouTube channel does a story on my sister and I, and people will just comment like totally random, uh, mean, unnecessary comments. And I liked your advice because I think that anybody can take that advice to heart, no matter if it's on social media or if somebody is maybe um, bullying you a little bit. Uh, you and Max both talked about how um, those people are just having a bad day and it, you shouldn't take it personally. And I know it can be hard, but I feel like that that's something really good that people can take away from that. Um, so we're actually going to take a really quick music break, but when we get back, um, 
We will continue this interview, and in the meantime, to all the listeners, make sure you follow Nekohama Matcha on Instagram while you're listening to the music, and you'll also be able to find Sana, Max, and the other co-founders of Nekohama's information on that page as well, so <laughs> for sure check that out. If you're just joining us now, my name is Isabel Burka, and you're listening to Build a Biz on Build a Bear Radio, and I am here with Sana Vlut and Max Hirsch. They are the co-founders of Nekohama Matcha, and we were just talking about how influence can be both a good and kind of a scary thing because sometimes people are a little bit negative but um, at the end of the day you just have to have confidence in yourself so on that note Sana I wanted to ask you um, you know we mentioned before the break that you have over 1 million subscribers on YouTube which is a huge deal Uh, so when you're coming out with new projects how much um, how much of the influence for the idea of the project comes from your subscribers and your followers and how much comes from what interests you as an individual i obviously i want to create content which is authentic to me which things i am passionate about things would excite me things i am learning Um, But I'm also listening to kind of my subscribers, my followers and like what they want to see and also kind of what they like. And I think my whole journey into cooking and healthy eating, for example, has really involved because of my following in a way. Like I always loved cooking. I loved it and I did it. But because of YouTube and I started putting like healthy recipes out there, I was like, oh, whoa, people like really like this. People really like need this. And I was like, let's do more. And while I was doing that, I experienced myself too. I was like, oh, I'm really into this and I love this. And like, I love to share this. Um, So I think it's very like a 50-50 and it's kind of like, it's really like hand in hand. Like, uh, yeah, I listen to what people want. I take my own, yeah, tool on it and great content around me. That's really cool to hear. And I think the most successful businesses are always started because people realize a problem or maybe some kind of revelation that they want to share with other people. And then after they put that out there, they're willing to listen to feedback from people as well. And then, you know, I feel like to be an entrepreneur, you can't really have like, you can't be have too much of an ego. And obviously I see this in your content that you're very humble and mm-hmm. You too, Max. And everybody um, on the Nekohama team just seems like they just really want to put a good product out there. So that's really cool. Um, And I have to say, I got my hands on some matcha. I was lucky enough because let me tell you, if you're listening to this right now and you're thinking about purchasing matcha, definitely follow Sana and Max and Nekohama because that matcha goes fast. It is so good. And even like my sister didn't like it before and she tried it and she was like, this is something I could get behind. So that's, that's Good amazing. I love that. So Max, your family is from Japan and Sana, did you grow up in the Netherlands? Uh, yes, I grew up in the Netherlands and I grew up in Zimbabwe. Um, but most of my family is from the Netherlands. Yeah. That's so cool. So you both have um, very like worldly experiences and also a lot of my favorite videos on Um, You two are traveling videos, which I love. And I would like to hear you talk a little bit about how you think travel and having sort of like this global citizenship has influenced your um, entrepreneurial tendencies and how you think that that relates back to who you are as a person. So in terms of like kind of having a global perspective, you know, I was fortunate enough to grow up outside the country, spent time in India, Japan and France. And Sana grew up in Zimbabwe, or his first five years in Zimbabwe, then moved to the Netherlands. And we were both able to see uh, different perspectives. I think that you, know, you kind of get uh, get the full spectrum when you're living in a country like India. And then when you basically travel from India to a place like France or Japan, you're getting even uh, even bigger spectrum, right? You're seeing everything from like the worst of the worst, to the best of the best, to the most uh, advanced cities to you know places that don't even have running water. And I think like, you know, when it comes to entrepreneurialism, everything that we're doing is to benefit others. So we want to bring health to people that maybe haven't had access to it, whether it's through, you know, better 
beverages, which then lead people to better routines throughout their day, you know, we really want to make sure that we have an impact on not just the people that are, uh, I guess, consumers of our product, but people out there that need help. So something that Sana and I are, you know, heavily focused on is education. And education has been something that Sana has valued for her whole life. It's um, something that we put a lot of time into. And there's a project called the Yumi Project that we are running with our co-founder, Jason Gorski. And Sana and Jason have been going into a schools in Brooklyn. And obviously now because of COVID, that is not possible. But what they were doing was they were mentoring young students in, I would say, lower income areas and working with um, certain classrooms full of students that were, I would say, on the um, lower performing side, meaning that they were coming from maybe rough rough upbringings or, you know, broken homes. And, you know, we would spend time with them kind of working on different, uh, actually, I'll let Sana talk about this. You were actually in the classroom. <laughs> yeah. So we would go into the classrooms and do social emotional learning workshops. Um, and for everyone who's listening and um, is wondering what this is, is kind of uh, workshops around like um, working on self-belief, confidence, uh, team building, and kind of like leading them through they're like, yeah, like a self, a, a path of growth. Um, and we thought this was very important because how the way how I grew up in like a high school was such an amazing experience with like the people I had there. And like, I found it so much fun. And I was actually part of a special um, class where they were doing testing with like together and see what the impact was on that. And it was so good. Like there was like barely bullying. And I was talking with Jason and he was like, this is really special. Like we want this to uh, bring this over to like, you know, younger kids and classrooms because we notice like all the life skills we need, we are not learning in a classroom. Like we're learning cl- like math, science and all the history, but we're not learning like, hey, how do you communicate with people? How do you manage a business? Like that, um yeah, how do you interact with people, colleagues, and like, how do you face problems or um, mistakes? So this is something we were like very passionate about and we really wanted to do. And I think the whole purpose at one point of our business too is to, yeah, really provide like help and uh, yeah, these kind of projects all over the world. And I think that because we traveled and grew up in such like diverse areas, we have seen the world and like we want to do something back. Mm-hmm. That's really cool. And I love that you you were talking about education in the, in the beginning. And Max is saying how much you value education. So in my head, I was kind of thinking um, just solely traditional education. And then you started kind of going more into like the emotional side of education, which I think is kind of groundbreaking because I've noticed that more and more people these days are finding alternative education paths. And I know that myself personally really struggle to feel like I was sort of like accepted in this um, traditional education system. You know, even today, like I'm still a college student and I really struggle to do things the traditional way, you know, because I started a business when I was young and obviously you two are both very entrepreneurial at a young age. And I like that you just made an effort to include people who weren't necessarily getting a super traditional education, but at the same time, you know, are capable of really cool things, just maybe not in a traditional way. So that's, that's really cool to me. So Max, Sana uh, briefly touched on the fact that we don't really learn how to run businesses in school. So if you could maybe walk us through how you're running your business right now and what's so unique about Nekohama Matcha um, so that people listening can um, maybe get some insight on that, that would be really awesome. All right. So it's a great question. So, you know, to answer, you know, what makes the matcha business unique, you you kind of have to look at the bigger sector, which is the tea business. And the tea business is a multi-billion dollar business. It's growing year over year, but it's also growing outside of, you know, where it's traditionally been very big. So you look at Europe, you look at Asia, and now in the U.S., people are adopting tea into their lives. So, you know, when we were thinking about matcha, we did a little bit of research into, you know, whether the sector was growing or not. And I think a great, um, a great way to find out whether or not you're in the right place is to see if there's a lot of competitors or to see a lot of people coming or entering into the market. 
And you can learn a lot from the other businesses that are in the market. So let's just say you wanted to go into coffee, which is extremely saturated. Um, you would then go and you know, see what other people are doing, see if there's any room for yourself. But um, you know, when we were deciding whether it was matcha, we, we really wanted to do something that we were passionate about. We wanted to do something that we, we loved. And we love matcha. We love health. And you know, what we felt or experienced after drinking matcha for a few weeks straight, two or three times a day, was you know, a, a, a really a nice a feeling of Zen, a feeling of calmness, but with also the, the energy that you would expect from a caffeinated beverage without crash, without the jitters, without any of those issues, the anxiety that I get when I drink a lot of coffee. And, you know, in terms of the matcha business, uh, you're starting to see a lot of, you know, pop-ups, little startups coming up, opening up their own little matcha bars. You have Chacha Matcha, you have Matcha Bar that's been in the U.S. for quite some time now. And they've really built out this market where they've, you know, educated people on what matcha is. We just wanted to bring in, you know, more of a traditional, you know, Japanese product that I thought that the Japanese people would actually love and, and enjoy. So, you know, when we kind of figured out, hey, let's do this, we wanted to come in with a premium product. And we wanted it to be, you know, probably the best product that you can buy at that price point. And I think we've accomplished that. But, um, you know, we still have a lot more uh, more to do. You know, our website isn't live. We, uh, we have to pretty much take all of the imagery for it. We have to figure out the copy. So, you know, it's definitely not easy. But when you find an industry or, you know, a business that you really like, you know, if it's um, an industry that has a lot of growth, then it's definitely a good one to jump into. Unless it's just a passion project. But I would definitely say do your research. Make sure, you know, you understand how big the market is. You understand who your competitors are, because sometimes you might be creating something without knowing that's the exact same as thing that's on the market already. And then, you know, you're pretty much just, you've re reinvented the wheel and you're not really creating anything unique. And I think also like we knew there were, you know, even if you type in an Amazon or whatever, or even in the store, you can get matcha in so many places, but the taste was really not good. And I was like, I completely understand why people don't like it because in the most places it really like tastes really bad. So we kind of also wanted to, we knew like there is a really good product out there and like a good leaf and a good like taste. And we were like, this is just something very unique and we would just love for other people to experience this. Mm -hmm. That's a really great takeaway. So when is the website going live? So we're launching in the spring. So hopefully around April. Yeah. But um, you know, we we've uh, we're definitely taking a little bit slower now because we want everything to be perfect. You know, we had an issue with our supply chain. We couldn't get our matcha kits in time, which then gave us, you know, which then led us to make the decision to push back our launch so that we can make a perfect kit that was beautiful and unique because there's a lot of kits that are out there, but that also wasn't very expensive compared to some of the other kits. So because we don't think that the tools to make matcha should be expensive if the matcha itself is very premium. So our goal is to bring in a product that uh, everyone can afford and use at home. Let me tell you, that is a relief for me to hear because I will definitely be needing one of those kits uh, because... Well, actually, my matcha making process is very professional. I put my matcha in a water bottle and I uh, shake it really hard until I can't see any more uh, matcha clumps in there. And um, sometimes it all the way dissolves and sometimes it doesn't. So <laughs> I might be needing to get myself one of those. <laughs> So Max and Sana, unfortunately, this is all the time we have left today, but thank you so much for joining me here. And to everybody listening, definitely go check out at Nekohama on Instagram and um, Sana Vlut and Matcha Bay is <laughs> Max's username. He got very um, creative with that one. So definitely go check out those Instagrams. And um, if you missed the beginning of this episode or you want to check out some other episodes, uh, check out the Build-A-Bear YouTube channel. And um, you can follow me at Isabel.Burka and you can also follow uh, Build-A-Bear Radio on Instagram. So um, just keep yourself in the loop with that and I'll see you next week. Thanks, everybody. Hope you have a great day. Bye.